I'm working with the Faculty of Arts option on a project called Land and Sea. Um, it's, an o it's an open air course teaching art students drawing skills through a focus on coastal landscapes. And when I heard they were setting up that course, I thought that's actually brilliant. There's maybe some way we can coincide. Um, so they go out to coastal landscapes and they invite along coastal workers who add to the visual narrative by giving their stories of working on the landscapes. The students come from a whole range of disciplines, architecture, fine arts, interior design, graphics, 3D design, fashion, textiles, um, photography. Um, they come from the UK and they come from abroad as well. This uh, year we had students from the Czech Republic and from Israel. Um, and as I said, it's been running since 2015 and I started also um, working with it in 2015 and there's now actually a waiting list every year to take this course. Um, so this is the first year, we went out to Berlin Gap and we went to see the remains of SS Uschler in UB121. Um, the course works the same every year, so we go to the site, then we walk out to the archaeological site. Uh, as we walked along the beach, I was pointing out in the cliffs where you could see um, ditches, where you can see pipes sticking out. that are all remains of buildings that have now fallen off the cliff because there's a big problem with erosion at Berlin Gap. I think on average, 70 centimetres a year, but um, there has been like metres going in one, in one fall at times. Um, when we reached the site, I talked to them about the site um, and then um, their tutor takes over. They do um, some guided drawing classes and then they're free just to wander and draw. Whatever, they, whatever catches their eye. Hopefully the archaeology, usually the archaeology. Um, for the last two years, I've taken them to Bishop's and Tide Mills, which is a site just east of New Haven in Sussex. It's much more accessible. Um, it's, not, it's less tide dependent, which is easier with their timetable. And there's a huge wealth of archaeology there. Um, there's the remains of the Tide Mill village. The, village, the Tide Mill was built in 1760 um, with an associated village for the workers. It expanded in the early 1800s, but unfortunately in about, uh, I think it was 1873 or 1875, there was a huge storm, dumped loads of shingle into the mill ponds, which considerably reduced the working capacity of the mill, and within a few years it, it failed, and it went out of use in 1883. The, um, the village, however, stayed, um, was inhabited until the 1930s. This is what it looks like today. Um, it uh, was partially condemned, and cleared in 1936. Um, and it earned the, the title in the Daily Mail, The Hamlet of Horror, was the headline, <laughs> with the unspeakably primitive conditions of disgrace to civilization. Um, the rest of the village was cleared in 1940 because they wanted the beach for defensive purposes. Um, there's also the remains of a First World War seaplane base there. Um, it's most recently be been recorded by a Maritime Archaeology Trust as part of their Forgotten Rex project, and Grant is sitting over there if you want to talk to him all about that. Um, so, oh, and that's the remains today. It's mostly huge slabs of concrete, but you can still see where the um, hangar doors, the sliders that the hangar doors um, were on, and different, and you can pick up the different buildings in the in the footprints on the concrete. Um, there's also the remains of uh, Chaley Heritage Marine Hospital. It was built in 1924 for boys with varying degrees of paralysis. It was felt that the sea air would do them good and they'd be wheeled out onto the sun deck um, to take in the sunshine and get dunked in the sea every now and then. Um, they were also taught crafts, um, so they would be able to um, have some form of career sort of when they left the hospital. Um, and that's the site today. So it's a very evocative site. So you've got the, you've got the, Marie, the foundations of the hospital buildings there. Just in the far distance, you've got the remains of the village. And going up that way, you've got the seaplane base. Um, the hospital and what was left of the seaplane base were also cleared in 1940 when they were preparing the beach for defensive, defensive work. Um, the landscape, uh, and particularly the village, has been the focus of a really long-running um, Sussex Archaeology Society community excavation. They're still working there. I know they've just opened up some new trenches this year. It's really super. So if you're in Sussex and you want to get involved, that's definitely, definitely a good one. Um, through, um, through citizen contacts um, at Sussex Archaeology Society, the 2016 cohort of students who went to Bishops and Tide Mills held their end-of-module show um, at Barbican House, um, which is the museum and gallery based in Lewis in Sussex. 
Um, and so it's just one of the pictures from the show. The, the colourful picture at the end, that's actually a direct, directly inspired by Bishopston Tide Mills. And it's, the, um, it's a reimagination of one of the cottages, um, of actually the, the gatekeeper's cottage. Um, yeah, the, the reimagined interior of the ruined cottage. Um, the course, one really nice thing that, that happened after this um, private view was that the course has actually been invited back this year to work at Lewis Castle. So one of their sessions is going to be drawing at Barbican House and the castle, which is just next door, and also to have a look through their incredible collection of antiquarian sketchbooks. Um, it's been... I mean, that's one of the really nice things as well. I mean, about the project as a whole, the number of people that we collaborate with, but also being able to put people together in their, in their own locality. So, as I say, the, the course are going back there this year, and that was in, organised independently between them because I'd managed to put them together um, last year. So, um, I think I'm going really fast, but that's because I'm worried about going over time, so I'll probably end maybe quick. Um, so, last Tuesday, I took the most recent group out to the Tide Mills, and this is... Um, the last two students standing um, <laughs> on the day because it was miserable. It was misty, it was atmospheric and very nice and artistic looking, but it was miserably cold and very, very damp. Most of the other students were sort of there for about an hour and then ran off to the cafe, but these two worked out there the whole time. Actually, but then when we went back to the cafe, they were already working up their drawings, so it was brilliant. The cafe was a hive of activity with loads of art students working, drinking cups of tea. Um, it's been, it's been really good to work with non-archaeologists, and that's why I wanted to highlight this one in a way as one of, my, one of the ones I really like working with, one of the sites I really like working on. But it's been really interesting to see how non-archaeologists interact with archaeology and heritage. And it's also been really valuable for me to learn how I can um, communicate better with people who aren't actually interest, interested in archaeology and heritage um, yet, because I like to think they are when I finish with them. Um, the feedback has been really, really good. Um, the architecture students especially have been saying um, how it's really helped them understand placemaking and a sense of place, which is obviously a big thing um, for developments, um, uh, you know, develop, big development projects. And in a way, I, I hope that that would be something that they can take away with them. Even, you know, I, I, it's not like I want the scales to fall away from everyone's eyes and everyone to go, actually, I want to be an archaeologist. This is great, but if people can bring some a greater uh, archaeological literacy to their jobs in design or in architecture, um, in development, then I think we've done a good job. Um, so, yeah, that's some nice feedback from students, lovely feedback from the University of Brighton, um, and that's one of the images that came out of the first year of students um, working at Berlin Gap. And um, that's me done. Over to all. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Oliver, so I work with Laura in the, the southeast of England. Um, and I've had, um, and Laura had as well, on, on a many trips out to Essex, the pleasure of working in some of the most interesting mud um, in the country, I think, at the minute. Um, which was very surprising. Not least as surprised as I was that anything interesting happens in Essex. Um, <laughs> Good, good. <laughs> so, let's move on. Two years um, <laughs> in the, uh, the Blackwater Estuary. Um, just to kind of put you in context of where we've been working, we had a look at a few sites in, in Essex and, and on the Blackwater. Uh, we originally started here in Malden, famed for its salt, where we looked at some uh, barge graveyards uh, and a number of vessels that had been uh, left intentionally hulked there, and we recorded some of those. And we, we also had a look at a little place called Rolls Farm, which I know... Uh, Peter, you'll be familiar with this one. It's, it's one of the survey sites that was first looked at in the Hullbridge survey of the early 90s and also revisited as part of the Rapid Coastal Zone Assessment Survey, which has, of course, been the backbone for all of the work that we've been doing. Um, so we had a chance to do a little bit of a survey, I guess an update survey at Rolls Farm, to see how that had changed in uh, the couple of decades since it was originally looked at. Um, but more importantly, or more popularly, we've been working over it in Mersey Island, and hopefully the number of red arrows popping out of that box indicates uh, the number of things that we've been looking at. It really has been uh, two years of, of actual genuine and joyful discovery, I suppose, on Mersey Island at the very least. I've lifted these dots from our interactive coastal map that shows you all of the features that we and our volunteers have added over the years. And you can see there's quite a few green dots on there, um, particularly in and around Essex, and some 
certainly not really on Essex, uh, on um, Mersey Island, but rather protruding quite way out into the water there. Um, we've added over 75 new features on Mersey Island in the last two years, uh, which is kind of phenomenal, really, especially when you see the type of things that we've been adding. Just a couple of demonstrations. That's uh, yet another 3D model. Uh, but this is uh, this one was taken actually just last week when we visited Mersey Island with uh, Historic England to show them really what was happening, the rate of change that's going on there. This is a piece of wattle hurdle work, which is quite typical of a number of the little spots and locations that we have around the Blackwater estuary. And um, just to kind of justify why I suppose we do these 3D models, um, I know my colleagues have kind of alluded to it, but for, for the purpose of this one in particular, on the mud flats here in Mersey, they, the, when the tide comes in, it comes in very, very quickly, so of course we have that very limited window to, to do the recording, and we actually sampled this hurdle after we'd recorded it, which means that we lifted bits off it, broke it up, and it was gone in the form that it was originally found. But because these are so uh, well scaled, these models, we can actually start to do things back in the office, like measure the diameter and the widths of some of these bits of the hurdle work, which of course lets us look at um, elements of woodland management at the period when this was uh, constructed. So being the reason that we've taken to the 3D modeling is it allows us to continue studying those sites that we know may disappear and that we can't really often easily get to. So that's why I have one of these up again. And this is actually, and I don't know if you uh, recognise that, Peter, but this is actually from Rolls Farm. So this is just a little further down the way. <laughs> um, and again, we have, uh, you can see here, a rather large section of hurdle work appearing, uh, which actually formed a little bit of a T-junction just here when we ended up in covering it. But that's just over five metres long. So you have these rather large sections of perhaps potential trackways propping up here, there and everywhere as the tidal mudflats are actually uh, receding. And so from structures that big to even bigger structures that have been revealed over the last, say, 10 years, um, this is at East Mersey, and this is uh, in total kind of length is about 30 metres end to end, and it has uh, a mirror structure, not as uh, exposed, but just around this size. Um, so we have these rather huge structures that are coming out of the foreshore. It's not just these little things that have been laid down. So there's been an awful lot to go at, including the odd occasional as uh, Lawrence alluded to a uh, human remain popping up out of the island. That one dated to 350 BC and coming from the western edge of the island. There's actually had to be a bit of a history of discovering remains on Mersey Island. This uh, photographs are courtesy of Mersey Island Museum and you can see the police officers here in 1962 very delicately um, <laughs> excavating some human remains with a pitchfork. Um, <laughs> And these were taken sort of around midway in the island, so we have quite a lot of examples of human remains being found on the island. But there's one little feature that I wanted to speak to you about just in particular, because it's been a particular interest to me and I know to the volunteers that have been working with us. And it was found just here, uh, which to give you an idea of where that is in terms of the shoreline, so that's 650 metres from the shoreline. And the reason I put the red marker on is because that indicates the furthest feature that we've recorded from the shore, and that was using our app on a very particular low tide, but it's over a kilometre offshore. So you can, I'm sure in your mind, visualise the sheer scale of these mudflats that we're actually walking and investigating. Uh, so it's no wonder, really, that we're finding so much stuff. But this is, uh, this is the first picture we ever received of our special feature. And what's nice about this is that it was sent to us by an oysterman, Daniel French. He's a very local oysterman who's had a company there for many decades. And he often walks the mudflats. And what's great is that he'd heard about the project through word of mouth. So the islanders were talking about us. And he'd taken this picture and he'd passed it on to us. Um, and it's interesting because it's three seemingly pieces of large timber with some rather nice cut holes in the end of them. Um, but they're not the only three. When we went out to have a look at this feature, it turned out we found a few more other bits. Uh, we've got a timber just here, number four, and a timber just up at the top there, number five. And on further inspection, when we went a little further southward, we found another patch of what appeared to be heavily eroded, uh, very similar looking structures. So all in all, we have something that may well be, if they're all related, about 150 metres long. So here's the team popping out to um, 
to work, and I showed you this because it's, it's a bit of a collaborative effort, this one we had. Historic England with us who are coming to do the scientific dating, taking some samples. We've got Jess Tipper here, who's the local county archaeologist. Uh, we've got our three super volunteers, as Esther would correctly call them, in the background there with their boat, ready to take the timbers away. Um, and then we have the rest of the team being members of the citizen staff who are there to conduct the investigation. So here we are cleaning it up, and you can really get a sense of scale and the size of these timbers just looking at them. Um, they're over two metres long, the very longest of them. Um, and that's what they look like, all beautifully cleaned and ready to be recorded. Um, very, very, very nice. And um, they're all oak timbers. Um, in this end, there was a stake left driven in between two of the timbers here, and we can only assume that these mortise holes, they were there for other stakes in which to be pegged to hold these things down to the floor, because it's, in effect, it's a trackway. It's a trackway across what turned out to be a very similar environment to the one that it was found on. Um, we did some very um, quick and uh, kind of fast and hectic <laughs> auger sampling with Mary, where we took four or five auger samples in time that we got, and from those results, we understand that that environment is actually a uh, brackish, salt marshy environment, a, a tight intertidal environment. So not all that different, but perhaps sea levels, of course, lower when it was built. The picture on the right there is what uh, <laughs> is what you get if you went cut one of these in half, because uh, they were so beautifully preserved. But of course, if we take a sample for scientific dating, and that date returned was 952 BC, which is really rather nice. So it's a late Bronze Age structure that has been revealed 600 metres offshore in the Blackwater estuary. But along with these wonderful discoveries, of course, there comes rather fast change. There's a reason that all of this has been revealed to us. And this selection of photos, uh, well, actually, there's a, a postcards that were uh, donated by uh, one of our volunteers, Carol Wyatt. And this shows the west end of the island, which I wanted to just speak to you so you understand just how much it's changing here. And they're all of a pretty similar view. It's the same kind of area. And they were sort of early 20th century postcards that show quite a lot of uh, growth of salt marsh and um, sands. And, uh, there's a very different picture, essentially, to what you see today, which is a rather flat and rather muddy environment. And you can see some of the features Lawrence mentioned here, the pits. Um, also, we've got lots of other little bits and bobs that have started cropping up there. So, an awful lot of change has taken place. This is one of the features uh, that we try to record. Um, this was taken in July. Um, you can see how muddy it is, all the footprints. This is when we went back last week. In particular, this stake here, you can see, measured it's about three centimetres in the uh, course of three months that had disappeared on that section of the foreshore. And that was partly due to storm. Brian, was it called? I wasn't in the country when that was. Yeah, Brian did some damage over on Mersey, but it's, of course, revealing the structure, but not only the structure, things like this are being found on the site. It's a piece of Roman Samian ware, uh, and it's one of many, many pieces of Roman pottery that Lawrence alluded to. And this is quite a crude distribution map of all of those bits of pottery that we found on the site. But the interesting thing about them is that they're actually very fresh. They have very fresh, clean breaks of them. They're rather large sherds, and we have some full, complete rims coming out of the foreshore. So what it's fairly safe to start thinking is that we've got some in situ deposit here of this tile doesn't seem to have been thrown overboard from a ship, perhaps, or washed up from anywhere else on the island. The concentration, the quality, appears to suggest that they were where they were found. The last kind of point that I just wanted to make about Mersey that is really, it feels for me anyway, it's the project has really brought a community together in some ways. We've had over 50 people attending our sessions all around the island. Um, we've had over 280 attend a series of lectures that we've put on, uh, some lectures given by myself, some by some of our volunteers. Uh, we have a regular slot in the local paper. Uh, <laughs> we write a few details and update the folks about what's going on. And we've had a host of offers of support from these people as well, uh, anything from boat uh, to homes to stay in, to barns to keep our kit in. Um, so it really has, for me, been quite wonderful to be able to put on these events and these experiences for local folks and be able to try and start to answer some of the mysteries of all those bits of timber that they've seen poking out of the mud in the many years that they've lived and walked the island. 
last point then, um, those beautiful timbers that have been preserved by uh, Historic England are uh, going to be returned to Mersey Island Museum. Uh, they had a little fundraising dig since July to get it and they needed to aim, uh, raise £6,000 and they have uh, they've raised too much money. The good people of the island have been um, <coughs> very enthused by what we've been doing and they really want to have these back and have them displayed in the museum. So um, that's a nice little story just to sort of say basically it works. Um, these three people in particular I need to thank. It's my last slide, I promise. Um, they're sat in the room, two of them are anyway, and you're going to hear one of the chaps, Mark, speak in a bit. But these guys have been enormously helpful. They fed us, clothed us in some cases, uh, given us somewhere to stay, given us a teepee to sleep in, that kind of thing. But they've been hugely supportive. And without their uh, ongoing enthusiasm and uh, very kind nature, uh, we wouldn't have got anywhere near as far as we have on the island that we did. Thank you.